Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to members, of the press, and public joining the local development committee. The meeting is being live streamed on YouTube, so welcome to everyone viewing on YouTube. To minimise travel, most officers are joining this evening's meeting via Zoom. Can everyone present hear me? Big heads, that's good. Uh, my name is Councillor James Beckles, the chair of this committee. Uh, for the members in the room, when you are speaking, can you please speak clearly and loudly so that the microphone can pick up what you're saying? Uh, for those joining by Zoom, please mute your microphone if you are not speaking. I will now ask the members of the committee and officers to introduce themselves. So starting from my left. Councillor Mahmoud, a member of this team. So welcome to everyone on YouTube. To minimise trouble, most officers are joining this evening. That's freaky listening to you, Gabe. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two of me. Lovely. Can remind everyone to Councillor Sayyid Basha from Little League Football. Um, Councillor Sabi Kamali from Stratford Ward and Deputy for Housing Management and Modernisation. Yeah, officers. I'm Hannah Richardson, uh, Development Manager, Planning. Uh, and I'm Jane Custance. I'm the Director of Planning and Development. Victor Solicitor. The rest of the officers online. Chloe? Yeah, Chloe To Planner and um, Newham. Over to Sophie. Sophie Hocking, Principal Planner, Urban Newham. My name's Janique, and I'm a Graduate Planner for Newham Council. Is that everyone online? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Alex. I work in the area regeneration team. Uh, we're putting forward one of the applications tonight. Yanni Pitsleides, Senior Regeneration Manager. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to remind members that when a vote is taken, it will be by way of raising your hand in order that we can capture this on screen. So item one, we start with apologies. So I have apologies from Councillor Sarah Ruiz, Councillor um, Carolyn Corbyn, Celine Patel, and Tony Wilson. Um, are there any more apologies for this evening? Okay. Um, item two is the minutes of the last meeting. I wasn't present for the last meeting. And I'm not sure if the members here are. Um, it sounds about right. I read it through it, yeah. Okay. Um, I think. Go ahead. Sorry, you know, I was present at the meeting. My, my attendance is not recorded. Thank you. Okay, and I've noticed that some in the present um, section, some of the councillors who gave apologies are also noted. Right. So, yeah, so councillors um, Femi Falola, Mohammed Rahman, and Salim Patel are also noted in the present. Thank you. So, are members happy to agree the minutes now or? Um, due to what the discussion that happened at the last meeting, defer these to the next meeting? I think so, because I think there's still an ongoing. Yeah, so it shall be deferred to the next meeting. I think that sounds fair. Good. Yep. Meetings will be de minutes will be deferred to the next meeting. So item three is declarations of interest. Are there any declarations to declare? Um, okay. Item four, determining planning applications. Members are asked to note the advice from the Head of Legal Services on determining planning applications. Is that noted? Yep. Yeah. Item five, announcements from the Chair. Um, the committee has received the following request to address the committee. Would the speakers please identify themselves when I call out your name? Um, so item six, um, in person, we've got Alex Talbot. Okay. Got Yanni Pastilis. Um, Elizabeth Flower. Kate yeah. Matthews. Okay. Uh, Kate Matthews. Harriet okay. McCauley. Yep. And Harriet McCauley. Uh, yep. Okay. And via Teams, you've got Tito. The Hi. Agent. Hello. And item six, Oasis um, Park. We've got Hayden Kreitzer. Yes, I'm online. Thank you very much. And I believe that is it. So now move on to item six, 
which is the former Canning Town Library. Would officers like to present? Could somebody um, enable sharing? Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, I think hopefully it's loaded for everybody now. Um, so moving on to item number six, um, the application site is the former Canning Town Library at 105A Barking Road, Canning Town. Um, the application site is located on the northwest side of Barking Road, Canning Town, and comprises a grade two listed building. The building is known locally as Canning Town Old Library, but the building's listing calls it the former public hall and library. So in terms of the proposal, um, the application is for planning permission and listed building consent for the extension and alteration of the building, as detailed in the extensive description on screen. The application is made on behalf of the London Borough of Newham Regeneration Team, who have secured funding through the government's levelling up fund to refurbish the building. Moving on to site, site photographs, this slide depicts the front facade of the building, as well as the entrance hall. The next slide is a photograph of the rear of the main reading room. These photographs were taken in 2022, and the condition of the building has deteriorated significantly since then, particularly due to water ingress within this room. The following plans outline some of the key works within the building. At basement level, the proposed layout has been amended to accommodate ancillary spaces. The main entrance will remain on the, on the ground floor as the main public access to the building. The proposal will modernize the area whilst retaining the original features of this floor. The ground floor will accommodate the cafe, archive reading room and digital media suite. Moving on to the first and second floors, um, it is proposed that the first floor will be leased in its entirety to a community oriented operator. And this space will remain in F1 use. Access to the first floor will be enhanced through step three access with the new lift. The remainder of the first floor will house a staff kitchen and staff room alongside WC facilities. The first, sorry, the second floor will be refurbished and remodeled so that it can be used as a learning and outreach space, served by a new lift and stair with a small rooftop extension. This space will be used as a classroom. Moving on to the proposed rear elevation, as you can see, a full width rear extension will be constructed from aluminium housing the new archive store. And in terms of the proposed front elevation, this will consist of fen fenestration alterations, including window replacement at ground floor to improve the thermal performance of the building. In terms of the principle of the development, the restoration of the F1 use is supported, as well as the refurbishment of the building itself. As the use is considered a community use under the local plan, the application has been determined in accordance with policy INF8. The applicant has demonstrated that the scheme meets all parts of this policy, as detailed within the report. Overall, the principle of the proposed development is considered acceptable in this location. 
the principle of development is supported through all levels of planning policy. In terms of urban design in relation to the external elements, overall, the scale and massing of the proposed extension to the rear, which will house the archive, is appropriate to the, ex to the existing building. The proposed rooftop extension is also of an appropriate scale and is also required to secure the viable reuse of the building by facilitating accessibility improvements. The proposed material palette is attractive and responds well to the historic fabric of the building. Additionally, a number of windows will be replaced to restore the historic design, improving the light quality of the ground floor and also to improve the thermal performance of the building as previously mentioned. The scheme is supported with regard to the external appearance. Turning to the internal features, given the building's grade two listing and to secure a high quality of design, a number of conditions are recommended to be attached to the planning permission and listed building consent. These conditions have been requested by design and conservation officers and planning officers concur with their necessity. These are all detailed within Appendix 8. The general ambition to retain and restore the original and historic detail is expressed within the internal alterations and is strongly supported. In terms of the heritage impact assessment, the National Planning Policy Framework sets out the process for determining applications affecting heritage assets at Section 16. Overall, particularly given the current condition of the building, the proposal is considered to enhance the listed building and will conserve it for future generations to enjoy. Where a level of harm has been identified, it is low level and the demonstrable public benefits derived from the scheme would outweigh any harm. Subject, subject to the conditions referenced within paragraph 1.33, the proposal is therefore considered to be in accordance with section 16 of the MPPF, which seeks to preserve and enhance heritage assets. Moving on to impacts to neighbouring amenity, these have been extensively assessed within the application submission. A daylight and sunlight assessment has been submitted, as well as a noise impact assessment, amongst other documents. Overall, whilst there may be some impacts upon neighbouring amenity during construction, these impacts can be reasonably mitigated through appropriate planning conditions outlined within Appendix 8. The proposed development would result in an improvement to residential, residential amenity and general neighbourliness, as the building is currently vacant and needing 24-hour security, as well as being in poor condition. Turning to sustainable transport, the development is proposed to be car-free, except for the provision of one accessible parking bay. Five long-stay cycle parking spaces are proposed, which is in accordance with the local London plan. Um, as well as short stay cycle spaces. Additionally, a travel plan has been submitted in support of the application. This sets out how active travel and public transport will be promoted to visitors to deter reliance on motor vehicle use. Moving on to delivering sustainable development, an air quality assessment has been submitted with the application, which demonstrates that the scheme will be air quality neutral. Um, a BRIAM free assessment has been submitted, which sets out that the building will achieve a BRIAM very good rating. And additionally, a preliminary ecological appraisal survey and bat emergent survey have been submitted in support of the application. Um, the reports um, in relation to um, biodiversity, as previously mentioned, um, include um, ecological enhancements, such as two to three bat boxes, wildlife friendly planting, bat friendly lighting, insulation of one to two bird boxes and insect nesting boxes. The proposal is supported in relation to sustainable development subject to an appropriately worded condition relating to a detailed landscaping strategy. Finally, in terms of other considerations, um, these largely relate to waste management and archeology. span um, Waste management and archaeology have been considered in the report. Um, the London Borough of Newham Waste Management team have confirmed that they are happy with the arrangements and um, the Greater London Archaeological Service have um, raised no objection in relation to archaeology. 
Therefore, in relation to these matters, the application is supported. Uh, moving on to the recommendation, um, the Local Development Committee is asked to resolve to agree the reasons for approval as set out within the report and the update report and delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to grant planning permission subject to the completion of a unilateral undertaking under Section 106. Great, thank you very much, Sophie. Um, we'll now move on to the applicant. So, Yanni. Um, I think uh, Tito, our planning consultant, is going to say a few words first. Okay, Tito, please Thanks. come in. Uh, my name is Tito. I'm from First Land, the planning consultant for this project. Uh, the proposals represent an opportunity to regenerate and reinvent the use of this historic site. The scheme will deliver clear, tangible benefits by providing a dedicated heritage archive for Newham in a new extension, alongside additional space for displaying historic material and learning for all within the existing building. The scheme also includes an ancillary cafe, which will further benefit and add to the community function of the wider building. The scheme has been designed to ensure there's no undue adverse impact on the immunity of surrounding occupants or indeed adjacent users. In this respect, noise is mitigated, upgraded modern equipment proposed, visual, visual mitigation provided. Um, the applicant's team has designed the building to be sensitive to the historic fabric as much as possible whilst upgrading its sustainability properties to ensure an efficient end result with PV panels, air source heat pumps, and other works as set out within the committee report and Sophie just mentioned. Uh, this has all been achieved whilst maintaining the building's heritage value. At its core, it remains a civic space for the enjoyment of the community, which is very key. As you'll see from Sophie's presentation, the historic use and heritage interest of the building has been at the centre of the proposals. Um, the scheme includes a sensitive extension with the material made of brick, metal and zinc, which complements the existing slate on the existing building and the brick on the existing building. The other key benefits are the provision of a lift to ensure access to all levels of the building, which is currently not the case, bringing the long standing vacant unit back into use, provision of a number of jobs and a refreshed year rear yard, which will benefit the staff of the building and the adjacent community links. The proposal has been the result of extensive pre-application consultation and a call with planning policy at all levels and should be supported. Um, I'm here and the um, architects are here to answer any questions and I'll pass over to uh, London Muneeran, the applicant in the council at the moment. Great, thank you very much, Tita. Um, so you will now have heard in detail about um, how this project complies with a local development plan. Um, however, we feel it's important for members of the committee and the public at home to understand in more concrete terms why this project is of huge importance uh, for the residents and visitors to Newham. The works are being funded in a large part by central government levelling up funding, with this project being the largest by allocation project to the borough's £40 million successful Luff bid. Um, it, it's a key project to catalyse the ambitions of the council's cultural strategy and will form a focal part of the borough of culture bid as a centre to celebrate Newham's rich history and emerging culture. The works, of course, will bring back a vitally important building in the heart of Canning Town, transforming it from an unloved and deteriorating shell that is attracting various forms of antisocial behaviour to a state-of-the-art heritage centre facility. The proposals seek to introduce a building which has an important socio-political history and bring it back into use as a civic space that the borough can be proud of and the likes of which the borough in recent years has not enjoyed the completed building, if approved, will be transformed with a drastic upgrade in its thermal performance and for the first time will be accessible to those with physical disabilities. Um, it will bring Newham's history and heritage um, to a much wider audience, revealing items of the borough's collections that have been hidden away in unsuitable conditions for decades. Digital interactivity is also at the heart of the plans of the building and the new facilities themselves will enable the digitization of Newham's collections and archives preserving them in perpetuity and delivering on the ambitions of the council's new arts aspirations. Um, it's hoped the building will attract thousands of visitors every year, regular users, those engaging with our collections for the first time, local school children, um, and those enjoying the planned leisure and events programs that we'll, we'll aim to deliver from the building. 
The council will deliver the vast majority of these um, activities and programmes free at the point of use, allowing users uh, the chance to benefit from an inspiring collection of local history in a way that won't preclude even our most hard pressed families. The building will also stand at one of the borough's principal cultural institutions within the heart of one of my, our most rapidly changing neighbourhoods. With a myriad of cultural and creative events planned for this building, it will be central in both our ambitions to become borough of culture in 2025 and as a cultural focal point for decades afterwards. While it's right and proper that you approve this planning commission and listed building consent in line with the planning officer's recommendations for the simple reason that the development is planning policy compliant, you should also approve this scheme for all the immense potential that this building promises for residents, businesses and visitors to Newham. Whilst all around we see from Birmingham to Croydon authorities having to sell off their historic buildings and civic assets, we implore you tonight to allow this authority to proudly restore this magnificent building and allow it to serve the people of Newham for an, another 132 years. Thank you. Next, um, we'll take questions from members. And just so um, viewers at home and officers are aware, we've been joined by councillors Rahman, Falola and Hussain. Um, due to the time that you arrived, you can take part in the um, debate, but you can't take part in the final vote. So any questions from members present? I had a few. Councillor Kamali. Um, the first one was um, around the operational hours. Is that the hour the service will be provided to residents or is that, is that the same hour the work is going to be carried out? I can answer if you'd like. Uh, so the, the hours in the committee report appear quite quite long um, to, to memory. Um, Until 4.30. Oh, sorry. That those that so those those are the proposed out service will operate from the building, um, and they're they're proposed to operate from Monday, uh, Friday, and then possibly on a weekend as well, and then possibly having a um, an evening uh, as well to try and increase accessibility um, of of the sort of heritage service, which is much longer than they're currently delivering at Stratford Library. Um, during the work that is going to be carried out, is yeah. that going? Um, is it going to have an impact on local traffic? As in, like, are roads going to be closed? It, what impact would it have around the local surrounding during work is carried out? Maybe Tito is is good to answer this one. Hi. Yes. Thanks. So there is um, a condition that requires a construction management plan. Um, so that will be fully detailed later on but it's mm. worth noting that there is a yard to the rear of the site where most of the deliveries and everything will go to the back rather than be on the road okay can i ask the other question yeah, go ahead so um do you have a tenant in mind on the first floor you talk about tenant space and renting it out do you have a tenant in mind or uh yeah you mean you want to go for something i go on okay um so because of the F1 use uh, and the fact that we've always wanted to preserve this as a, a space for the community, we are doing a second round of expression of interest, mm -hmm. explicitly looking at the borough's voluntary and community sectors. Um, we're going to be deploying, you know, hopefully what's quite an affordable rate for the, for the space. Uh, and we're really, really keen to work with anybody, including yourselves as members, to identify voluntary and community sector organisations that may want to take up space in the building um there's obviously they're going to have to be sort of commercially viable enough to pay you know a certain amount of rent but they but probably more importantly they've got to contribute to the overall vision and what we're trying to deliver in terms of social value and community wealth building benefits from the building as a whole um so we're basically still going through that process but the building won't be complete probably until April, May of, of sort of 2025 at earliest. So, so we have a bit of time for that. And we're, we're basically engaging with the wider sort of volunteer and community sector now to identify who that should be. Okay, my last question is, um, I came across um, the development also passes a BRE overshadowing. What's a BRE? I want to pass, pass that one to Tito as well. Or, uh, Elizabeth or Harriet? Yeah. I can answer that. Um, it's the building research establishment, so it's related to okay. REAM and sustainability criteria, um, and they control and govern um, daylight, sunlight assessments and how those are carried out. Okay, and a final question, sorry. If, if during carrying out work, it has a noise impact or any kind of impact around the local residents, obviously, if anything else happens, they're going to reach out to council, local councillors. 
is there any way of are we going to be in a position to put a stop to or work away what what would be what would be the plan if something like that happens I think from experience, most um, like construction sites will have, they're supposed to have like details of like contacts for contractors, et cetera, um, advertised on like site hoardings, um, which provides details for how to make complaint. But there, um, there is a condition um, requiring a construction logistics plan to which um, covers off matters in respect of mitigation of potential impacts arising from during the demolition and construction phase, um, which we would need to approve um, for implementation. Um, but then there's um, methods of being able to like notify um, the council departments if there are um, seemingly breaches of um, any of their conditions, including the construction logistics side of things. Any further questions? Thank you. Can I ask um, yeah, Councillor Fellow and then Councillor Garney. Um, I'm just going to follow up from what she said about, um, I think she might be thinking about pollution. And when you talk about pollution, you talk about cars, when you're re receiving goods and when those goods are being delivered. Uh, is there any specific arrangement for that to minimize pollution in that area? And not only that, car parking or truck parking, is there any provision for that? So that will all be um, have to be detailed um, through a, the construction logistics plan, which um, forms one of the recommended conditions. It's condition three. That's I think that's in the list of recommended conditions, which covers off um, all the different elements pertaining to the construction logistics. So it includes it includes. Um, and that is to do with like trip generation, site access arrangements, where they're going to store certain goods, um, like the construction goods, um, temporary road closures, if necessary. That all has to be um, like reviewed and like approved by the local planning authority with the council's highways department um, and also the um, council's environmental health department who who have more specific regard to like the potential pollution aspects like dust mitigation, odour, um, uh, uh, like water runoff, et cetera. So that's all covered under the construction logistics. No, there's going to be an increase. I mean, you uh, an increase in car and vehicle flying that route. And uh, during, the, uh, during the process, is there any way, I mean, what, what I'm trying to, figure out is that when are you going to be taking your delivery it's going to be in the night it's going to be in the evening it's going to be in the morning that's so that will all be considered as part of that construction logistics plan um and it's um as part of the review it's working out when is the most appropriate time for the likes of deliveries that are going to have least impact on the surrounding um neighboring properties um including um like any existing like highways congestion depending on what other um kind of things are in the area that might contribute to congestion and i think they do look at routes for um like large vehicles um in terms of routes to the site um from the potential sources which may or may not be in the borough and um trying to ensure that that's not going to cause what well, it's going to have as least impact as possible on the local highways network. Any further questions? Thank you. Okay. Councillor Garley. Mm -hmm. Chair, uh, old Town Library. If you look at the library provisions, you know, throughout the council, and uh, and the in particular the use of library for for the voluntary sector, community groups, and you know this. Um, uh, holding seminars, holding meetings, et cetera. And there is a huge demand and also people are very put off, very much put off uh, uh, about the lack of facilities and you know, amenities or, you know, uh, in, you know, and in particular, the black and minority ethnic groups, I mean, they, they have particular disadvantage accessing the council premises. So given the level of uh, development or the proposed development, I, I suppose 
the this uh, this purpose is a historical purpose people will be excited local community will be really excited that you know this at last long you know this this uh, you know this facility will, will, be, will be made available for local organization i want to emphasize that you know unlike the normal you know Chinese development the, the there have to be special provisions so that the local community can access and in a small small community groups who are put off by the expensive cost of hiring permission so is there any way the local development community can put a put, put, put a uh, conditions on, on the development okay. uh, proposed use in future is there a way so we can um put a conditional requirement that um, Council Ghani's request for affordable space for local community groups, especially those catering to black minority ethnic um, communities, especially the makeup of, of the borough, to access it? Or is that already built into the um, application and the it's, funding? I'm not too sure. I think you might need to cover off in terms of what the requirements are in terms of the funding, but just in terms of the this planning application, if... The, the application was actually, if they were required to get planning permission for, for the actual use, then that could potentially be something maybe that we could consider. But this application is more so um, requiring planning permission for more the operational, the physical development, um, uh, the extensions and alterations to the building to facilitate the continued use as a community facility rather than um, requiring planning permission for a new community facility. So we don't necessarily have um, control um, through the planning mechanisms. Yes. I bring in Jane, as I can see that she's indicating. Jane? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering whether we could bring the uh, applicants in on this because they must have had to do um, an equalities impact assessment um, as part of the development of the project. So um, they should have considered which types of groups would be able to access the facility. But as Hannah said, this isn't a new community facility. It's just a reuse of something that exists at the moment. So, Yanni, can you come in on this? Yeah, so I think it's worth coming back to Alex. Um, our expression of interest and in finding a community organisation, we're still, uh, you know, over a year away from the building being uh, refurbished. We have some time in, in, in kind of hopefully uh, meeting some of your, your ambitions around finding those kinds of uh, organisations. We're also, um, as part of our levelling up funding uh, requirements, required to deliver community space on that first floor. But I think it's worth stressing that whilst the library function or the, the, the library use has kind of moved across the road, most of this building will still be uh, run by the council and offered to the public free of use um, with lots of library adjacent uh, functions happening inside of it. Um, but in terms of the first floor, yeah, we will we'll endeavour to kind of meet, meet those aspirations between now and when the building is uh, opened. We are, um, in terms of the leasing strategy, um, lease disposal, you, you do have to be, you know, careful in sort of saying this is only for a certain type of group in and of itself that, you know, we need to be careful to, to be compliant in doing that. But what we are looking at is how we 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 balance a few things. So it's, it's delivering some revenue for the building, which is going to be important for the council given its financial position. Um, while also obviously creating a really usable, refreshed space for our for our local um, community and voluntary sector organisations. There are maybe a few different ways you could do that. You could look at a sort of longer lease term for a single organisation. But other alternatives we looked at is more of a sort of a consortium or group approach for, for voluntary sector. So perhaps a voluntary sector organisation doesn't have the money to commit to a five day a week lease with the council, but it but it may want it you know, one day a week shared with other um, communities. So that's one way that could increase the affordability of it. The other is we're looking maybe even not at doing a sort of long lease type of arrangement. So it could be more sort of ad hoc. And again, I stress all of this, the idea is to 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 try and maximise uh, or to try and have that trade-off of obviously some income, but obviously making sure that it's accessible and affordable for our community sector. So we've already worked with property to get them to commit to 
applying a sort of social value, you know, lease for the building, which has been used in some other community centres. Um, and that, that will bring it down to as low as 80% of market rate, which is as low at the moment that Newham Council has committed to, to bring space down. So, so I hope you can see there that we are really trying to think of lots of different ways in which we can in increase the accessibility of this of this first floor space. Okay, thank you very much. I just ask a question on that. Yep, come in. So um, I know, because um, at the moment there's lots of different small organisations and every organisation doesn't have a large amount of funding, and but they do a vast amount of work. So is it possible to like, look into like giving them a desk and a chair kind of like space so that way it doesn't cost them a lot they have an address that they could get their mailing and register on company house but at the same time it's it keeps the organization running keeps the people coming in and like if that's something that it could be looked into as well i think if you can see the designs anywhere on the first floor you can see that there's a large hall space um, that was the historic reference library and then adjacent to that there's an office space on the side so the idea could be that a charity, for example, rents, you know, a desk space for a certain portion of the week and then does some activity and possibly multiple charities could take that up over the week. Again, that's kind of talking to how we're thinking about trying to make it as accessible, particularly on price point. Um, and I think that would that would come quite close to what you're sort of describing there. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a question of well, three questions. One is around the facade and it was mentioned by Tito about the use of brick, metal and zinc in terms of the design. I was wondering, because this building is a grade two listed building, and this is going to be obviously a very modern um, exterior, uh, rare extension, um, is it going to be complementary? Because I couldn't necessarily see from the images, um, but they're not in colour, so I guess you have to use your imagination, um, what they're going to look like, and would it be con complementary to the existing um, ex external facade of the building? I think Hi, I'll join. I'll jump in on that one. Um, so the uh, main exterior material, the new materials, is all to the rear elevation, which is where the archive building is. So the facade itself, the front facade, and all the um, you know um, grade two listed part of the building will all remain. All the brick will remain. It's a mix of London stock brick, red brick, and grey slate. So the archive building is in like um you know, that nice um, sort of Corten steel looking metal cladding, which is red. So that would tie in nicely for the red of the building that exists, um, as well as the grey slate tying in with the other, um, the grey zinc, sorry, tying in with the slate of the existing building itself. This is in the design and access statement. Um, it does show the materials that are being proposed and how they complement the building, the existing building itself. Um, and another one about, I guess, the um, section of the building, the PV panels, are these going to make a substantial difference to, I guess, the energy that's emitted by the building? Is it um, to be used to get a good BRAM rating, but it's not going to make a neg negligible difference? Are these actually going to make, will there be a significant impact with, by having the PV panels to the reduction of um, energy costs to the building? I think Elizabeth or Harriet might be best placed to answer. Yeah. I can come in on that. Um, so the area of PV panels that we're including on the roof is a it's a fairly sizable array. It's not sort of one or two panels. Um, it's quite a large number. We've been cautious to make sure these aren't visible from the street. So we've kind of sought to maximise the amount of um, energy improvements that we can without affecting the heritage of the existing building. Um, but also on the energy front, we're introducing a new air source heat pump system, which will decarbonise the heating system for the building, as well as other um, energy upgrades like improving the thermal performance of the windows, etc., either through replacement or secondary glazing. So in conjunction, all of these measures will be a significant um, upgrade in the energy performance of the building. If I may as well, so we've we've applied for many of the sustainability enhancements to this building to a another central government fund called the Public Sector Decarbonisation Fund. Um, and that's only been possible because of the extent to which we are reducing energy use in the in the building. Um, I think on the calculations, it, it will be down by somewhere in the region of 340%. So it's a really, you know, it's really not just for aesthetics or to meet BRIAM. It really is going to, across the whole range of measures, including what Elizabeth talked about, but obviously lots of the fabric and 
really, really bring this building in line with our net zero ambitions as a council. Um, and that's testament to the fact that we've applied for that fund for. Sure thing. And my final question is around community wealth building, especially around supply chains um, and providing a relevant where we can in the construction to local firms. Um, is that within the heads of terms? Is that within the policy framework of this application? That would be in the social value matrix that we that we use in procurement. This is a sizable procurement. Um, uh, we will judge social value up to 10% of the quality score. So if you put those things together, you know, there's a real emphasis on what can be achieved by the contractor. Um, and local supply chain, particularly in a borough like Newham, which has quite an extensive construction sector and construction supply sector, feels very, very right to take advantage of in, in this procurement exercise. And that will all be happening between, hopefully, between now and March 24. Okay. And in terms of um, the social value matrix and the quality score, um, is that subject to QIA, EQIA as well, or is that a separate matrix that might be used? Just so that, you know, a lot, I imagine a lot of the companies, especially within yeah. um, Newham, again, it's... Um, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic firms that are slightly smaller, but might be subcontracted. Yeah. There's an EQA attached to that to ensure that they might um, benefit due to, I guess, discriminatory practices that they might not be able to benefit from construction trade and um, other benefits. Or is that, is that built into the whole that will be built procurement process? The whole procurement process, yeah. 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 We, 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 to, to, be, to be clear, we haven't done one specifically for the procurement process would one be done we definitely do yeah okay definitely yeah. be looked at 100 cool. percent. any quick further questions from members no then i will um ask to move to recommendations members would like to move to recommendations i think everything that we've sort of mentioned if that could be added yeah okay we're looking for it for sure and can we move to recommendations for this application, please? Sophie, the presenter, back on screen. Oh, yes, please. Can you present on screen, please? <laughs> Sorry, it will take me <laughs> one moment just to load it. So the local development committee is asked to resolve two items. I won't read it out, but hopefully members can see on the screen. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hands. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry to that interrupt. To um, no, I've just realised there's an error on that slide. Okay. We just need to make clear that it's two separate applications. So that's the application for planning permission okay. and then application for a list of building consent. So I think, Alex, am I right in that we need to do two separate votes? Um, to cover off because it's two separate okay. applications. Will there be a second uh, um, recommendation? That's yeah, yeah it's, um, it's, it's, it's up to you. You can take both applications in one vote um, or you can do two separate ones. But just being mindful that it's, yeah, the two. I think let's do two separate then. So agree the reasons for approval as set out in this report and update and delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to grant plan permission subject to the completion of the unilateral undertaken under Section 106, so on and so forth. So can I just ask a quick question? On this two separate votes, what does it mean? So there's the application for planning permission, mm -hmm. but then because it's a listed building, they also need listed building consent. Okay. So there are two applications submitted in tandem aside each other. Um, so if you have a look at um, the first main page of the report, sorry, I don't have the page number in front of me, um, where, it, where it summarises the re recommendation, um, that, that sets out that it's the two separate recommendations. So the planning permission is um, required to be subject to a whole list of conditions, which are listed there, and the unilateral undertaking, which is to cover off the um, necessary travel plan and related um, monitoring and measure fee. And then there's the separate list of building consent, which has a separate list of conditions. Sorry. Part recommendation is on screen now. This, mm -hmm. this one covers the full planning permission. Mm -hmm. So after we've voted for that, a second planning permit 
recommendation will come up for the listed building consent. We'll have to ignore the screen because it's not on the screen. Oh, it's on the screen. Oh, okay. But it's on your. <laughs> on our screen. Okay. So, members, um, with what the officers have said, let's take in tandem the full planning permission. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Any against? Sorry, Athena, you can't vote. I'm sorry, Athena, you can't vote. Really? Yeah. No, no, you can't vote. Huh? <laughs> you can't vote. Sorry. So, all those in favour, let's do that here. Sure. Great, that's unanimous. And for the listed building consent, all those in favor? Great. That cover it off? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So now move to item seven, is the Oasis Park, Stevenson Street, Canning Town. Oh, we then, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, can everyone see my screen? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. Um, item seven relates to the application site at Oasis Park, Stevenson Street, Canning Town. Uh, please refer to the update report circulated, which refers to the addition of the specific figure for the monitoring fee required as part of the existing head of terms of the legal agreement. The site is bound by Bitter Street to the west and Stevenson Street to the east. Currently, the site is operated by Power Day for acceptance and treatment of waste collected by the skip hire business and third party customers. The application seeks planning permission for the demolition of existing open sided waste enclosure and ancillary office and erection of two enclosed buildings, works to the external yard, external storage, and associated works for use as a tra waste transfer facility under Class B2 for the processing and recycling of commercial waste. The image on the left and in the center shows the existing site, and the image on the right shows the proposed site plan. Building one will provide a gross external area of 1,429 uh, 1, square meters and will be located on the northern section of the site. Building two will provide a gross external area of 1,526 square meters and will be positioned to the south. The proposed buildings with a ridge height of 17 meters and 14 meters will feature pitch roofs. The buildings will be enclosed with concrete push walls, which will extend up to five meters high. Above the push walls will be profile sheet cladding. A green wall system is proposed to the Bitter Street boundary and part of the Stevenson Street boundary. An area of green roof is proposed to part of building two. The remainder of the roof to building two and the roof of building one will accommodate solar PV panels. The image on this slide shows the view from Stevenson Street with the existing two-story former office building. The image on the slide shows the view from Bitter Street. The open-sided enclosure comprises a large part of the site with the remainder comprising hard standing, which is used for the open storage of separate recyclable materials, skipped storage, car parking, way bridges, and circulation space. A pylon operated by National Grid is located on the northwestern corner of the site with associated overhead cables. The site has an environmental permit which allows the acceptance and treatment of no more than 350,000 tons of waste per year. Treatment is described as manual sorting, separation, screening, bailing, shredding, and crushing or compaction of non-hazardous waste into different components. Planning permission was granted for the change of use to waste transfer station in 1995. In 2018, the Local Development Committee granted planning permission for an extension to the existing waste management facility. This permission has been implemented, but not completed. A screening opinion was issued in December last year, which concludes that an environmental impact assessment is not required. In terms of the principle of development, the site is located on a local mixed use area, which seeks to protect and promote employment uses that are compatible with residential use. Whilst the waste management facility is not considered to be a use typically compatible with residential use, in this instance, the use is established under a previous planning permission. The proposed fully enclosed building will provide an improved level of environmental protection with, re res with respect to air emissions, dust and noise, which will deliver a more neighborly operation and would make the facility more appropriate in terms of the transition of the area to employment-led mixed-use development. The principle of development is therefore supported. In terms of design, the submitted design and access statement outlines that the form and layout of the proposal is informed by function, site constraints, and in the industrial environment of the location. The function of the proposed building is to enclose the recycling plant and to provide visual screening. The height of 
The proposed building is dictated by the scale of the recycling plant. One of the site constraints is the location of a seven meter wide underground high voltage cable route for which maintenance access must be facilitated. This constraint divides the site necessitating two enclosures to accommodate the plant. Separating the enclosure into two buildings also contribute to breaking down the overall mass and visual impact. Building two will be utilized for the reception of waste materials and initial processing prior to being transferred via conveyors to building one. LBN design offices recommended condition on material samples. The scheme is supported with regard to design subject to conditions. In terms of neighboring amenity, the nearest residential properties are located approximately 60 meters to the east beyond Stevenson Street, the rail tracks, and Manor Road. Given its separation to nearby residential properties, there is no unforeseen adverse impacts on the neighboring amenity in terms of loss of light and outlook, sense of enclosure, and overshadowing. 56 properties were consulted and no representations were received. The submitted noise assessment demonstrates a significant reduction in the contribution of noise from the proposed development compared with the existing use, based on worst case assumptions. LBN Environmental Health Offices recommended conditions on contaminated land and construction and demolition environmental management plan. The proposal is supported in relation to the impact to neighboring amenity subject to conditions. In terms of sustainable transport, the application site benefits from 10 existing car parking spaces. The proposed development seeks to remove one standard car parking space and provide a disabled parking bay. The submitted transport note states that due to the 24 hour operational requirements of the site and the shortfall in public transport during the early morning hours, it is considered reasonable to retain the existing parking provision to enable the existing operation of the site. The transport note also pointed out that the travel plan will encourage car sharing to facilitate early hour travel to the site and through the monitoring of the travel plan, car parking demand can be reviewed and car sharing spaces can be dedicated to incentivize, incentivize car sharing. 12 cycle parking spaces in the form of six Sheffield stands will be provided within a sheltered cycle store. Details of cycle parking spaces will be secured by condition. LBN transportation offices recommended conditions and planning obligations on construction logistics plan, delivery and servicing plan, travel plan monitoring contributions, section 278 works and car parking permit free development. In terms of delivering sustainable development, the application is accompanied with a BRIAM pre-assessment that indicates that the proposals are set to achieve excellent rating. The submitted energy report shows a regulated energy demand of 14 kilowatt hour per square meters and a PV generation of 67 kilowatt hour per square meter achieved via a 1,500 square meter array. The cumulative on-site savings exceed policy requirements and are welcomed. A condition is recommended for an energy statement to be submitted prior to occupation to confirm that the proposed measures have been installed and the development remains zero carbon. Notwithstanding the above, the relevant building works associated with this proposal will be required to undergo full assessment against building regulations, within which energy efficiency will need to be addressed. LBN Local Lead Flood Authority reviewed the submitted documents and raised no objections, subject to a condition to secure further details of the drainage strategy. The proposal is supported in relation to energy, sustainability, and flood risk management subject to conditions. Other considerations include archaeology and employment. The Greater London Archaeology Advisory Service reviewed the proposed development and confirmed that they have no comments. The application is accompanied with an employment strategy. The number of jobs will be increased from 18 to 34. The Council's Economic Regeneration Team reviewed the submitted document and calculated an employment skills contribution. Subject to the applicant entering into the legal agreement, the proposal is considered to meet the relevant policy criteria in relation to maximizing local job opportunities and economic benefits of the development. Officers are therefore in a position to support the scheme. The Local Development Committee is asked to note the committee update and resolve to agree the reasons for approval as set out in the officer report and delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to grant planning permission subject to the completion of a legal agreement under Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act, based on the heads of terms identified at Appendix 9 of the report and the conditions listed in Appendix 8. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Hayden, from the applicant agent, can you present, please? Yes. Hello, I'm Hayden Kreitza. I'm the planning officer from Quads, representing Power Day. Just to echo what Chloe said there, really, is the site's been operating as a waste transfer station since 1995. It currently consists of a uh, two-story former office building on the east of the site. 
as an open-sided waste enclosure to the south with an office building to the west. Uh, the proposals comprise the demolition of the open-sided waste um, enclosure within, within the ancillary office and the erection of a, uh, two enclosed buildings linked by the enclosed conveyor uh, used to process recycling and commercial waste. Uh, it's considered that the designs will improve the area in respect with uh, air emissions, dust and noise, and it will deliver a more neighbourly operation, which will make it more acceptable in terms of the uh, Chloe said, um, in terms of the transition to the employment-led mixed-use area. Uh, in the sustainability credentials of this scheme, uh, we've, got above, we've got above the policy. Uh, we propose P the PV panels on the uh, buildings, the roofs of the new buildings, which uh, allowed the processes inside to operate at net zero carbon. Uh, we've, we've accepted a condition for the energy monitoring energy statement to prove this one's um, the site's up and running. The designs of the building have been uh, operation-led, but we've worked with the uh, urban design officers at Newham to ensure that uh, the massing and the design of the site is appropriate with its setting and will have no adverse impact visually. As you say, there's a slight increase in vehicle movements uh, resulting from the increased capacity. However, our submitted transport statement and TfL have uh, demonstrated that there's, there's unlikely to be any significant impacts onto the road network uh, arise from this proposal. Uh, we believe, subject to the conditions proposed, we won't have any uh, impacts on the surrounding area. Uh, our proposals will improve the current situation. And that, that that's it from me. Great, thank you very much. Um, just have a question around yes. the jobs. Um, so there's an increase, an increase of from 18 to 34, what sort of jobs, what sort of jobs um, will they be around the site? So there will be, mainly it would be to do with the waste processing operations on the site. Uh, there will be, I believe, some involved with the on-site ancillary office as well, but the majority of the increases will be to do with the additional um, waste processing. Okay. Um, and the energy statement, is there a time frame in that for you to be um, energy efficient or is it, did you say net zero or? Yes, so we will be uh, in line with the GLA guidelines, we'll be net zero. Um, so you have a timeline the, attached to timeline, that? Uh, we'll have to submit the energy statement. I believe, Chloe, correct me if I'm wrong, it's prior to occupation. Yes, that's correct. Um, there's a prior to occupation um, condition. I believe it's um, just trying to look for the number. It's, uh, condition fifteen. Um, so they'll have to verify that the they've like carried out um, the works according to the approved um, energy statement that they've provided for this application. Okay. Um, and in terms of the waste that was processed, um, did you say it was commercial waste? So it's a mix of construction, uh, demolition, and commercial waste. And what kind of um, nothing? Obviously, nothing toxic or no. The no has this um, waste on site, so it's mainly material for recycling. So it's timber, metal, and hardcore. Okay. Um, any other members' questions? Council? I had one. Um, just one follow up. Um, the, in terms of jobs, how many are they going to be reached? How many local residents are going to be reached out for a job? Like, would it be applied to new home residents? Yes. Yeah, so, in in line with uh, policy, where there's the condition to is it thirty five percent from new home? Realistic, we would we will try and meet that as as much as we possibly can. We will advertise how it we and everyone we directly employ. Uh, we will try and meet that target. I believe there's a financial contribution as well for when we do not meet this if we do not meet sorry uh so it's on page 68 of the um agenda um there's head of terms under employment um so there will be 30 percent local employment during the construction period to include uh yeah there are like several bullet points on the uh, page 68 where which members can refer to okay. any further questions Kelsey? i do um Sorry, Chloe, I picked up on something. You said that residents were consulted. So how many residents were consulted um, in terms of more in terms of numbers than percentage? And also what was their main concerns? 
Yeah, uh, so 56 properties were consulted and we haven't received any representation from them. Um, and again, because it's uh, suffered by a railway um, to the like and the Stevenson Street. So um, yeah, like we haven't received any neighboring objections or like we don't think that it's going to um, directly impact on the like neighboring properties. How did you and, reach out to them? Was it by direct mail? Oh uh, yeah, online? by direct direct mail and we also like have the um website um like so the 56 properties were contacted by direct mail and um members can also um fill the application there has been site notices um displayed outside the site and there there has been like 21 days for them to comment on it okay and um Again, I wanted to know, would that affect the local traffic in terms of disruption? Because obviously those are the um, later on um, that you pick up, because there has been places where the work has been carried out, but later on realized because of lorries and that needs more space in terms of turning in, you have to take away certain parking space. So have, has there been an um, area um, impact assessment done on in terms of how it will impact local residents around noise, um, disruption in terms of traffic and um, yeah yeah um so the uh the applicant actually engaged with us before submitting this application we had had like pre-application um engagements so um lbn transportation offices were at the pre-app meeting and we have been working closely on this so um tfl has also been consulted on this application and they've provided feedback um in terms of like uh any highway impacts they haven't like, really objected to it so um there has been a section um on page 75 to 78 of the agenda, um, which uh, assesses the tr transport impact and um, subject to the conditions and head of terms, we don't think that um, there will be any um, impact that would be detrimental to uh, residents or yeah, the existing businesses nearby. Okay, thank you. Um, any further questions? Okay, Councillor Garnet and then Councillor Raman. Yeah. Because the application is just with commercial ways. And I suppose in the consulting, in, in, in the consultation process, okay, the citizens were concerned. But what about the commercial, you know, local commercial enterprise, whether they were consulted and uh, what was what, what are the opinion or what feedback we do we get, you know, from commercial, you know. Okay. People. Um, just in terms of letters that were sent um, out, they would have they wouldn't have um, discriminated between like residential or like commercial or industrial. Um, it, it would have been like a buffer of properties um, nearby that were sent letters. So that would have um, in all likelihood included like commercial um, surrounding commercial businesses um, because I um, understand there are more like commercial industrial businesses close by. Um, that particular site than residential close by. Did you have a follow up or supplementary? Yeah, this is supplementary. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Garden, did you anything else? To mm -hmm. add? No, okay. Councillor Marmon. Yeah, supplementary, the uh, councillor Sapia is one. I uh, said the 35% local people will be employed. So that's 35% or minimum 35%. Sixty-eight and uh, point eight. So it's thirty-five percent of people. Is this minimum thirty-five percent? It would mean minimum thirty-five. Minimum thirty-five percent. Yeah. Not maximum. Any further members have any questions? No. Okay. Um, I've got no further questions. Chloe, can we move to the recommendations? Yeah. Thank you very much. So all members, uh, please see the recommendations on screen. Um, I won't read it out, but I'm sure we can all read those. So we'll move to recommendations. In favor, please show hands. Okay, all those um, against, please show your hands. I'm not completely against it, but um, I don't know how it works. It's all new to me, so apologies. I just want to get some feedback by at least some resident from the sit 56 because it doesn't sit right that nobody got back. So I don't know if that's abstaining or how that works or is that doing? Um, you can abstain. So 
Um, no members against, so any members abstaining? You abstaining? Your hands? No? Need to indicate. <laughs> um, that, yeah, I'm abstaining anyway. Abstaining, okay, thank you. So that is carried for the majority of votes to approve. <laughs> Move now to item. So we can do bowl in. Um, Janique, do you want to present, please? Yeah, can you see my screen? Voting. It's up on screen now. Just turn it to present and Yeah, I'm just trying to switch it over now. Yep, okay. So item eight relates to an already approved mixed use scheme located at number two Bolin Road in East Ham. Along with the committee report, please also refer to the update report circulated which refers to the addition of the 500 pounds monitoring fee required as part of the existing heads of terms of the legal agreement. The application site is the former East Ham Working Men's Club and is mostly surrounded by residential properties consisting of two-storey houses and three to nine-storey flats. There are several commercial units and other local amenities nearby. Upton Park Station is an estimated 11 minute walk from the site. This application is for an amendment to an already approved planning permission referenced 18-03321-FUL. The proposal seeks consent to amend the current affordable housing tenure by changing all four consented shared ownership units to four proposed social rent units the proposal is being secured for a deed of variation to the Section 106 agreement attached to the original planning permission. This slide shows photos of the site from the west and southwest elevation. This slide shows a photo of the site from the southeast elevation. This slide shows two images of the already approved proposal design. Given that the overall scheme was fully assessed and has been approved, the only change on this occasion is the makeup of the affordable housing tenure, which is proposed to be amended for this application. All other matters are acceptable as per the original approval. Therefore, the only key considerations to consider are the principle of the development and the affordable housing tenure. All other considerations, such as the urban design and placemaking, impacts to neighbouring immunity, delivering sustainable development, sustainable transport, employment, and the habitation regulation assessment will remain unaffected by the proposal. This site already has planning permission for a mixed use scheme consisting of 42 residential units, which contain private and affordable housing and the redevelopment of the East Ham Working Men's Club. The principle of the development was established under the original application, 18-03321-FUL. This proposal only relates to the change in affordable housing tenure and nothing else. The already approved mixed use scheme was granted for 24% affordable housing and 66% private housing, which includes six social rent units, four shared ownership units and 32 private units. The approved affordable housing tenure is split into 75% social rent and 25% shared ownership. The proposal will seek to switch all four shared ownership units to four social rent units. As the shared ownership units are being removed, the only addition, sorry, the additional social rent units will consist of two extra one bedroom spaces and two extra two bedroom spaces. The overall housing tenure will remain unchanged at 24% affordable housing and 66% private housing, with a revised affordable housing tenure of four social rent units and 32 private units. 
So no other amendments are being made apart from changes to the already approved affordable housing tenure. The private housing tenure will remain the same. This slide shows the already approved affordable housing tenure on the left and the proposed affordable housing tenure on the right. The four consented shared ownership units on the right will be removed, which means there will be no more shared ownership units. Also, as a result of the shared ownership units being removed, the social rent units will increase from six units to 10 units altogether. The addition of more social rent units will help with serving the needs of new residents to provide affordable housing, secure social tenancies, a quality standard of living and 100% social rent housing. The proposal is supported with regard to the affordable housing tenure and subject to the completion of a deed of variation to the current Section 106 agreement dated the 17th of February 2020. Here are the visual floor plan images of the already approved affordable housing units, which are all located on the left side of the floor plans and spread out across three levels. This is another visual floor plan image of the already approved affordable housing units on the left. As already discussed, these are the other considerations which have been previously assessed and will not be affected by the proposal. Please note all prior planning conditions and Section 106 agreements in relation to the already approved mixed use scheme would still apply. With respect to the above matters, the proposal is supported. The Local Development Committee is asked to 1. Agree the reasons for approval as set out in the committee report, the updated report, and 2. Delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to grant planning permission subject to the completion of a legal agreement under Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 as amended, based on the heads of terms identified at Appendix 10 of the committee report and conditions listed in Appendix 9 of the committee report. Thank you. Um, I've got affordable housing um, and I guess the percentage, why it's so low. I can imagine um, the applicant will probably say it's due to the viability, but um, surely our policies are quite clear about um, the number of affordable homes that we expect in terms of percentages. So what um, came out from conversations with officers and applicants um, during that whole negotiation when they submitted the application or in that the application stage? Yep. So in terms of um, changing the tenure split, um, the benefit in that is that overall it becomes 100% social housing, so social rent units. So instead of that split, that was um, shared ownership units and social rent. So altogether, it would be 100% social rent. And in terms of the viability assessment, I did um, remember from the original report that was also assessed. And once that was assessed, I believe that was what the agreement was, what um, viability that they could afford to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the members have any questions? I... Councillor Garney? Yeah, in, uh, previously, in the viability report, was the survival of of four or five uh, shared ownership units. Uh, how now, after two years, you know, this, uh, it's, it, uh, my question is whether the same viability in uh, you know, a criteria in the consideration are still valid or not. Yep. Yep. Sorry, I might have to revert that question to Hannah. I couldn't quite hear so well. Um, just a, a, a querying why, so the proposal was deemed accept, acceptable um, under the original application, being at that mixed tenor split of um, shared ownership and social, then how is it now more vi viable? Um, or, or viable to be able to like change over to like wholly so um social rent was the variation proposal subject to further viability assessment 
Um, no, it wasn't subject to um, further viability assessment. Um, so I think because at the time of the original proposal it was that, that it was scrutinised by our independent viability assessors back then, that that was like the maximum reasonable um, affordable housing provision at that time. And they've since come back realising that they can actually change it to wholly social rent, which is of a greater benefit um, and then in terms of like what we would like. We would much prefer like more social rent over shared ownership. Um, so that is something that we would be looking to support. Like it wouldn't be a... So if the viability assessment has changed um, from the shared ownership now social rent um would that necessarily does that mean there's probably more scope for more affordable housing within this development or is this what they have the 10 that they have and they're offering is um what we can accept or can we push for more yeah so because they've increased the social rent units that would um um, therefore mean that there would be more affordable units because in terms of the shared ownerships not everyone can afford those types of housing so um, it does increase it to more affordability for this type of development and our social rent rented home you said it's open to everyone but is it specifically open to people within Newham on our housing waiting list do you know um, I'm not particularly sure but I would believe so okay they would be yeah, subject to the standard like nomination agreements secured by paying sure. obligations. Okay. Yeah, any other members? Yeah. Any other questions? No? So you've asked my one. Okay. okay. So um Janique, can we have have you got the recommendations up? You've read my mind. Um, oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so members, please um bear in mind that the um what we're meant to resolve. So local development committees asked to resolve those two criteria there. Um, those in favour of the application, please show hands. Are there any members against? Any abstentions? Okay, abstention. Thank you very much. Um, that is approved. So the last item is item nine, which is the date of the next meeting. It's the 28th of November, 2023. Please note that in your diaries. And if there's nothing further, I call the meeting to be closed. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you.